Hello, everyone, and welcome to Handmade Hero, the show where we code a complete game live on stream. I, um, it's going to be a slightly shorter stream today than it normally is, maybe about 20 minutes shorter or so, uh, only because I just didn't want to push it too long. I only wanted to stay on stream for about two hours or so rather than two and a half or three, which sometimes I do, uh, just because I was pretty sick over the past two days, and I'm only now just, just now feeling better. I was still feeling pretty lousy last night, actually, but... I'm feeling okay today, uh, but I don't want to push it. So I, uh, I'm going to do it a little shorter than normal, but other than that, we should have a normal programming uh, day. Before I get started, I did want to re-mention, I mentioned it last week, but just figured two weeks uh, just to be sure. Uh, I want to mention that the folks over at Handmade Network, um, who, uh, as you know, build the site that uh, we use to host the Handmade oh, Hero no, forums. No. no, you do not need to show me an ad right now. Uh, they have just finished uh, adding their open project submission. And if you are somebody who's working on a project uh, that you feel like is appropriate for hosting over here at Handmade Network, so uh, if it's a project that you feel like is um, about dedicated programming and you know caring about programming and that sort of thing and wanting to spread uh, the sort of um, that sort of uh, I don't know for for better for lack of a better term the ethos of like you know being serious about programming and trying to do um, really high quality software, uh, that they have got to submit a project button now. And so all you have to do is just register on the site. Um, if you haven't already, which you may have if you've ever used the Handmade Hero forums, then your username and password from there will work. Uh, and there'll be a submit button here so you can submit a project uh, for consideration. And then they, uh, you know, if the project gets picked up, uh, it, it'll get hosted on here um, uh, with all, along with all of these uh, other projects that are on here. A lot of pretty cool projects already on here. Uh, Tweet with C is pretty cool. It shows how to write a Twitter cl client directly from uh, C using uh, just using the curl uh, DLL, if, uh, which you can download pretty easily. Uh, SDB libraries, of course, Sean Barrett's uh, collection of, of uh, libraries for doing all sorts of great stuff uh, that are really easy to integrate. For Coder, the editor we use on stream. Um, it's also got uh, Milton on here, which is the drawing package we use on stream. Um, I don't know where it is. Here it is. Uh, and so there's just a lot of stuff on there that's pretty cool, including a bunch of projects I have not checked out yet. Because uh, a lot of them are still, you know, they're, they might be pretty early uh, in uh, I, I, in their development, right? There's some ones on here that I'm particularly excited about. Uh, just there's there's a couple of debugging projects, uh, and I don't know how much they'll come to fruition or not, right? Anytime you start a piece of software, you never know what, how it'll come out. Um, but if any of these debugger projects come out, uh, well, that's going to be pretty exciting too, I think, because uh, I would love to have more options for debugging in Windows than I have right now, because uh, it's kind of a little bit constrictive uh, the way it is right now. Anyway. I just wanted to make everyone aware of that if they weren't already. Uh, so if you're someone who's working on a project that you think would be a good fit for the site, uh, you can now just go ahead and submit it. Um, and uh, that's really all you have to do. Uh, so that's it for that. And uh, now we can move on to the Handmade Heroing. Today is day uh, 358. We have one minor issue. It was just an oversight on my part. Uh, we did all the work for this, but I forgot. I even said it. Uh, that we needed to cast um, uh, a particular, we need to cast function from a const to a non-const care in order to pass it um, so that we could be clang safe and we just missed uh, that one issue. So we're going to take care of that and then we will be on to 3D. That's, again, it'll just take uh, a quick second. Oops, that's not what we want at all. Um, don't even know why that's still there. Uh, that's a good point. That's a good question. Let's just get rid of that. There we go. Uh, all right. So let's go ahead and, and, and jump in here. I'm going to go ahead and open up uh, Forcoder, uh, and I'm going to grab that project file. Uh, and again, I'm just going to go in really quickly and, uh, and change that one. Uh, that's not what I wanted. That's what I wanted. I'm going to change that one piece right there. You can see uh, where we use function, uh, because you can sort of see, <clears throat> that is, if my head was not in the way, uh, you can sort of see there's almost nowhere where it gets used, right? Uh, it's only this one location. And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to pass uh, the Kerastars as necessary in here. Uh, now, the debug name where we pass the Kerastar, this doesn't actually get used, I believe. Uh, so if you look at what debug name does, we stop using uh, that thing that gets passed down. And we left it in as a vestigial remain only because we would we would have loved to have been able to put it there. And our whole system was working with it being put there. 
Uh, but of course, GCC and Clang ruined our fun by making it not be an actual predefined string. It's actually a variable. Um, <coughs> it's, it's actually a, like, as if it was a static const string inside the function that you're in, uh, which is kind of a bummer. Uh, so anyway, we had to undo that. But here is the only thing that I think we have to change, uh, and that's it. So let's just uh, go ahead and, and get that going. I'm going to say, uh, all right, uh, this should be fixed as of day 358. Please let me know if it doesn't resolve all outstanding clang issues. Thanks again, Casey. Uh, Kim has been amazing at uh, telling us uh, the stuff we need to do. So is Martin's. Uh, up here, Martin's posted a, I don't remember where it was, uh, but Martin's posted here. No, I don't know. Martin's posted something somewhere else, I guess, uh, a big list of things to fix. Uh, and uh, it was great, because I think now we just compile on Clang out of the box, because we fixed all the things uh, that were not uh, Clang compliant. And I, I wanted to do that for the folks who like to compile the code base on Clang, because there's no reason uh, for us not to support that. The compilers aren't that different at the end of the day. So it's not really, if you're careful, uh, it's not. And you know, if you're careful and don't use a ton of C++ like advanced stuff, uh, one of the things that's generally true uh, in the past is like Microsoft's C compiler tends to not be as compliant with the C++ standards as it gets updated, as does Clang. Clang tends to be really uh, up to date on those sorts of things. So you can definitely get into situations, usually the other way around, uh, where if you, you know, you're a super, super C++ person and like to use all the latest features, on Clang, you pretty much always can. On uh, Visual Studio, you, you may lag a bit. And uh, so when you're, you know, if you're on Clang doing all your crazy C++ stuff, and then you bring that code base over to Visual Studio, you may find that a whole bunch of features you were using just aren't in yet. And you can either cross your fingers and hope that they'll issue an update sometime soon that fixes them, or you just have to stop using those features, right? So that does uh, pose a problem sometimes. Going the other way is usually not a problem. Going the other way, it's usually just small things like this, like using uh, a couple things that may be not quite standard, and they work on Visual Studio, and they don't work on, um, on, uh, on Clang for whatever reason, and you got to kind of uh, sort that out. Or there's warnings, like Clang doesn't like the way you cast something, and Visual Studio is OK with it. So it's usually just more like minutiae like that going the other way. So usually there's no real reason. If you're already compiling on Visual Studio, it should be relatively straightforward for you to make sure that you can compile on Clang as well, because the chances that the compliance on Clang are, is not as good as Visual Studio is low, right? If you're sticking to just standard stuff. Uh, OK, so <clears throat> let's talk about where we're at today, uh, because I think at this point I would like to get started on 3D stuff. Uh, and just talking about sort of what our goal is for the next couple weeks. Um, and this is pretty much the last time I think that, that I'm going to really do any work uh, that's not gameplay related. So after this, I think I'm going to go ahead and move on to just implementing game stuff as much as I'm loath to do so. Um, as I've said many times, I would much prefer to just write engine code forever and have somebody else write the game, but that's not really an option uh, for obvious reasons since I'm the only person here. Um, so, you know, we'll program the game as well, and we'll just, you know, muddle through it. Um, I'm sure we'll do a fine job at the programming since I know how to program, but, uh, you know, our game design is not going to be the best game design in the world. That's just the way uh, that it goes when you are not a game designer. But I'm okay with that. The goal for this is to have all the programming documented and to give good programming resources. And hey, all the source code will be out there. So those of you that are saucy game de designers uh, will always be able to improve it after it is done as well or make your own games on top of it. Um, as I said many times, the source code to the entire game will be released into the public domain uh, no later than two years after it's released. So uh, the entire code base can be used for other things at that point as well, at least at that point, if not sooner. Um, I could leave myself open to, le to releasing it sooner than that, just not later. Uh, so let's just talk about what I wanted to do here uh, so that it's clear. Um, so we implemented a tire pipeline. Uh, and that pipeline is partially 3D, partially 2D. So what do, we, what do we essentially do? So the way that we created things uh, at, at the present time is we sort of have an idea of a 3D world. 
And that 3D world is really, in fact, 3D. Uh, we actually support like 3D bounding boxes and stuff like that, uh, and 3D collision. And a particular person uh, or entity in the game of any kind, a tree, a uh, human, whatever, um, can be at any location in the 3D world, and they can move in 3D. So somebody can, can literally like hop up in 3D and do sorts of all sorts of crazy stuff, who knows what. And uh, then at some point, we kind of switch over to 2D. And where we switch over to 2D is a little bit hazy. Uh, not what I, I don't mean to say that we don't understand it, because we wrote it. So obviously, we, you know, we know what the transition is. But it's hazy in the sense that it doesn't kind of, there isn't like a hard line where it comes over to, from 3D to 2D. It's sort of just like at the entity boundary where entities get output. Uh, and then what happens after that, there's definitely a place where everything's in 2D, but there's also kind of a, a middle crufty area where things are sort of in 3D, sort of in 2D. OK. Uh, and then we have an entire 2D uh, sort of pipeline where we've got things like sprites uh, that, that get sorted. So you know we're now looking at the screen. Um, <clears throat> And these sprites get sorted uh, based on like where they overlap, and we actually build graphs to determine, you know, like what the sort order should be when multiple things overlap, and all this sort of stuff. And essentially, what I found when doing this, and you have to remember, I'm not a 2D game programmer. I'm really a 3D game programmer. Um, <clears throat> I've almost never. Uh, I've never really worked much on a serious 2D system. Uh, and so you know, I didn't have any idea ahead of time about how this would go or whether I would like it, right? Because it was a new thing for me. I'm used to rendering things uh, in 3D for the most part. And I'm not used to, to having a switch to, to, to 2D at any point, really. And so uh, this, the 2D-ness of it uh, ended up being kind of uh, distasteful to me for a number of reasons. Uh, one is I did not like the sort. I thought the sort, the, the, the concept that I had to build graphs of things and sort them uh, is really bad. And the reason that I think that it's really bad is because I think it really puts some hard constraints on the number of sprites you can have on the screen at once. And while this doesn't pose a problem presently for us because uh, we're not really pushing it, uh, I don't see a lot of options for doing some things that I probably will want to do in the future, like uh, you know more aggressive use of the particle systems uh, and things like that. And right now we don't have a problem because the particle systems don't spawn you know hundreds of particles that are all overlapping. But if we were to do that, if we were to spawn hundreds of particles that are all overlapping, those would form connected graphs that have to get sorted, and that's just it's just pushing a lot of logistical. Um, sort of work onto the CPU that I'm really nervous about. Uh, and I feel like it will just constrain what we can do graphically in the game. Uh, and so I really didn't like that. And I also didn't like uh, the fact that we didn't have the ability to use perspective properly. Uh, I, you know, I've kind of gone back and forth on this. I still don't really know how I feel about it. Um, but I do kind of feel like I would like at least the option of experimenting more with allowing the perspective uh, to actually be more natural than it is. Um, and for example, having it so that we could do uh, you know, our dungeon wall sort of stuff uh, looking more like this sort of thing. And when you move left to right, having it actually shift. Um, I don't know. I, I don't like the fact that we've sort of hemmed ourselves into only being able to do sort of much more rigid uh, upright stuff. Because I don't know, just having looked at it and played with it a little bit, I don't know that that's really the best answer there. And so I also felt like that was a little constricting. Um, so what I wanted to do is I want to say, all right, look, I'm just going to call that an experiment that failed. Uh, it's not that there's anything in particular wrong with it, because Plenty of games ship this way. Um, you know, all the old arcade games didn't have a Z buffer or anything like this. So you can trivially continue down this path and uh, and do it this way. And you could ship Handmade Hero as it is right now, uh, graphics-wise, and still have a fine game, right? Uh, you know, if you take a look at what we've already got here, I'll run it. Um, if you take a look at what this looks like, 
you know, uh, if you replace this art with final art, you know, this is fine, right? It's moving totally fine and smooth wise with some bugs we might clean up or something on there, but that's a totally playable sort of a thing, right? So I'm not suggesting that there's anything wrong with the approach, but in terms of wanting to push some of the other stuff in there, uh, I just feel like I'm going to want to do stuff like aggressive particle systems and stuff because we have the capability of doing that now, and I don't see any reason not to use it, but I just don't see any way to get there with this kind of a back end. I just don't like it. And part of that may just be uh, my naivete in the 2D world. You know, one of the things that's true about programming is when you built up a certain amount of experience um, with a certain type of pipeline, in my case, I'm very used to 3D pipelines, then it can, be, um, it can be that your brain just isn't used to thinking about how to solve the problems uh, cleverly in the 2D world or something like that. So it could just be my sort of um, having had a lot more experience with 3D pipelines. But in general, that's uh, just the perspective that I come to it with. I don't see a lot of ways of making the 2D system uh, perform as well as I think the 3D system would if we embraced uh, sort of some more of that tech, like uh, Z buffers and stuff like that. I was going to avoid them if we could, but just when I kind of got down into there and sort of saw what was necessary if I wanted to have a purely 2D pipeline, it just doesn't seem uh, like it can get as far as the 3D pipeline uh, could. So what I'd like to do is basically back up uh, to this part here. And there's nothing in particular that I care, um, that, I, that I'm upset about with our 3D, the way that we're doing it. Uh, there may be some things we want to improve here over time, but they are not essential because we do know the 3D position of everyone in the game right now, and that's all we really needed. Uh, so we'll just clean up anywhere in there that we were accidentally not caring about the 3D position of things. Uh, we can certainly fix that. But then all I really want to do is sort of start at this point where we were taking our world and our sim and all the stuff that we'd already done. I'm going to leave that pretty much intact. And all I'm going to do is start a little bit of minor surgery on this part here. Um, I mean, I guess you could call it major surgery, but really like the, the architecture isn't going to change much. It's mostly about pulling out things, like getting rid of the sort and turning on a Z buffer. Uh, so really, it's, I, I don't even know how major the surgery is going to be. Uh, but either way, let's just say surgery. Uh, we'll leave major or minor to the history books. We'll see whether uh, it turns out to be major or minor. And take sort of the stuff that we were doing um, before and look at how we can just put everything to the screen in a 3D way instead of putting it uh, to the screen in a 2D way. Uh, and that's really all I wanted to do. All right. Now, even though I think architecturally, uh, just because of the way that we've done things, uh, this isn't probably going to be that big of a deal in terms of changes to the structure of the code base because it's still going to fundamentally be uh, a roughly the same uh, thing happening. Uh, we're still going to have just a push buffer that we put stuff into, and then that's just going to get retired to uh, the rendering API. It's going to look exactly the same as it does right now. Uh, we may find, nonetheless, that what we're doing there uh, will require a lot of work because we're going to have to engage much more dramatically now with the 3D API because we're not just splitting sprites to the screen. I mean, that's all we're doing right now. Like, the only things we're doing right now, I mean, we do a little bit of, um, a tiny little bit of work uh, with the 3D APA right now because we allow multiple frame buffers uh, for doing that fade in, fade out stuff that we're doing. Uh, so we do a little bit of work right now with that, but we're going to have to engage a little bit more with the 3D API because now we are going to be in full 3D. We're going to have to turn on a Z buffer. We're probably going to want shaders. Uh, we're probably going to want a lot of stuff in there. And so we're going to have to engage a little more with the 3D API. I don't think there's anything wrong with that because that's what people have asked for many times anyway. I think people on the stream want to know that stuff because it's the reality of it. I don't love covering that stuff because it's just so underbaked all the time. Uh, you'll see when we get into it just how janky some of this stuff is. It's ill thought out. It doesn't uh, form a cohesive whole. Uh, it's plagued with lots of legacy stuff. 
Um, it, uh, you can see that it doesn't really understand where it's eventually going. And it's not coming together in terms of a unified architecture for a computing device. It's got all these problems that, compared to looking at how a CPU works, it's just real bad. Uh, and so my hope is always that someday that uh, industry kind of consolidates and gets their act together with defining a real programming model for themselves. But until that day comes, uh, we are stuck with what we're stuck with. And so I kind of hope that I didn't have to dive into some of the minutia there because it's really, I hope, the kind of thing that in five years, perhaps, no one will have to think about. Maybe 10 years. I don't know how many it will be. Um, but you know, uh, you know, maybe I should just say, uh, well, it's worth teaching anyway because that's being really optimistic to think that the industry will come together be before then. So who knows? But anyway, so that's unfortunate. But that's just probably what we'll have to do uh, because we're going to want some more control over how things are being put to the screen at this point, uh, if for no other reason than the fact that we are still a 2D game, and so straightforward 3D uh, polygon rendering is not going to be 100% um, correct for what we need to do. We're going to have to play with some sprite card sort of stuff. Uh, and so we may need some shader stuff to do things for us that we would normally not need. So even if we don't push uh, the graphics quality too far, so we wouldn't necessarily need shaders for that, uh, just doing things like basic lighting will probably require shaders uh, because of the nature of our 2D uh, world and how we're probably going to have to use it, right? OK. Um, so that's fundamentally what we need to do. Now, let's talk about uh, the difference between Z-buffer and sorting. And uh, I've got about uh, three minutes before the hour break here. Uh, so let's just talk about this real quick, and then we'll maybe uh, try to just go in and turn it on, right? Because that's the simplest thing we can do to get started. All right. Um, so let's talk about sorting uh, versus Z-buffer. Uh, and this, is, this goes back, really, uh, in gaming to the Quake days. That's how old uh, this sort of situation is. And um, uh, the reason it goes back to there is because Z-buffer wasn't a particularly viable scheme. Uh, on CPUs uh, bec uh, back in those days, the 386 CPU wasn't really fast enough uh, for a Z-buffer scheme. So you were always kind of talking more about uh, sorting kind of stuff. Maybe I should say a 286 wasn't. I don't know. I don't remember what the hardware was at the time. Yeah, sorry, I can't remember. Uh, but basically, like pre-Quake, uh, most things were in this category. There was probably some game somewhere that used a Z-buffer for something. Uh, and uh, folks who are very ardent students of 3D rendering in games history uh, may uh, be able to point to some places where it was used prior to Quake. But Quake is the big one, uh, so I'll talk about that for a, for a second. Uh, anyway, so most of gaming history up until uh, the Quake time period was in the sorting camp. And what this basically meant was, you know, when we were drawing things to the screen, if two things were overlapping, what we tried to do is just figure out which one of uh, them was in front. Uh, so, you know, if this is A and this is B, and it turns out that B is in front of A, right? So A is like back behind it. Uh, then what we try to do is uh, draw A first, right, and B second. So we would draw A in, uh, and then we would draw uh, B in to overlap it, right? Uh, and the reason we did this is because we simply didn't have any time inside the inner loops that we're drawing these things. Remember, this is all on the CPU. Uh, to do any sort of anything, really. We just had to kind of make sure um, that we had the fastest possible memory uh, copying that we could to get stuff onto the screen, right? Uh, and then on top of this, you know, the phrase sorting doesn't really quite cover uh, how advanced people were trying to be with a lot of these things. There was also entire systems based around nothing, um, I mean, uh, whose entire purpose was to eliminate overdraw, right? Because when you have this kind of sorting, uh, what you can notice very quickly is that if you take a look at what happens right in here, you wasted a bunch of time copying A into this region because B is just going to overwrite it. So unless B happens to be transparent uh, or translucent, you spent a bunch of time 
writing things um, from A that you didn't need to. And so furthermore, you would, because again, uh, it was so expensive to do anything on a per pixel basis in these days, you would even get things that would try to do much more advanced stuff, like figure out that A is actually that and B is that, right? And so it could break it up into two rectangles, for example. So here is A1, here is A2, and then here is B, and do it that way, right? And these took all sorts of forms, uh, and even Quake, which is what I was about to talk about in terms of the transition to having a Z buffer, has tremendous amount of work spent, um, the whole system of the BSP and, and how that was divided and portals and all this stuff was designed to eliminate as much overdraw as possible as well. And uh, so again, I just want to emphasize the fact that in these days, per pixel cost was incredibly important. <clears throat> Uh, and it, you had to really, really be careful about that sort of thing. So this is how things work. They tried to figure out what was at each point um, in, a, in a region on the screen and then do something that would copy it to that part of the screen and off you go. All right. Uh, now there's a lot of problems with this, right? And it, only, it really only makes sense when that per pixel cost is so high and so dominant that it makes sense for you to uh, start actually doing the work to split things up. And as you might imagine, it only really works uh, for things that are relatively large. Because if you imagine you have lots of tiny things, right? <clears throat> In a case where you've got lots of particles, let's say, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, In a case where you've got lots of particles or something that's fairly tiny, uh, there really is no way to save the time anymore. Because as, you know, as, as the individual objects you're dealing with, or I should say, let me, let me use the word primitives, right? Because I, I don't want you to think of objects in the gameplay sense. So individual primitives, like particles or triangles or sprites or whatever they are. As primitives approach the size of pixels, so when a primitive becomes you know, three by three pixels in, this, in the world, then the cost of filling them ends up being roughly the same as the cost, perhaps even less, uh, than the cost of doing complex testing of the intersections of them or trying to sort them or doing anything else, right? So it only really makes sense doing, you know, per primitive, looking in between primitives and trying to figure out how to like reduce overdraw and stuff only makes sense when that work is cheaper than the cost of doing the actual filling, right? Once that's no longer true, now you put yourself in a situation where all of this work is actually harming you, right? Uh, and this is what I was afraid of in the Handmade Hero Pipeline. I saw that happening and I just was like, mm, I think this is a, I really don't want to be back in this period. You know, I know we're kind of looking at the game as sort of a bit of a retro thing, but I don't really want to go that retro because it's just old tech and it just doesn't make sense on modern hardware. <clears throat> so, uh, what happened during the Quake era was uh, that things started shifting over to a Z buffer, even in software. So Quake actually uses a software Z buffer. Excuse me. Like I said, kind of recovering from illness today. Kind of gross. OK. Anyway. <clears throat> so. Uh, Quake actually uses a software Z buffer. If I remember correctly, it's a write-only Z buffer for one of the passes. Um, so when it's drawing the world, it writes to the Z buffer but never reads from it because it can do a perfect draw of the world. It knows exactly what it needs to draw and in what order uh, to make that work. But then when it draws characters, it uses the Z buffer. <clears throat> That's what I recall anyway. Uh, and the reason for that was because since characters, it's very much like in Handmade Hero, uh, since characters can kind of be integrated into the world in ways that are kind of complex to determine their relationship between primitives uh, in the world, it becomes very difficult to figure out you know, a character's arm that passes through a doorway, right, may need to draw part of the arm on one side of a bunch of world primitives, but the rest of the character on the other side of the world primitives. It just becomes very difficult to get all of those sorting cases right. And you end up writing <clears throat> incredibly expensive code for the polygons of the character, right? 
And what that means is it now puts really difficult uh, constraints on how many polygons you can have in the character, right? Uh, because again, these sorts of things don't scale. Uh, once the primitives start getting smaller, the sorting time and the figuring out how to process them becomes very dominant and you end up in a bad situation. And so what a z-buffer is, uh, for those of you who don't already know what it is, uh, it's, it's actually uh, called a z-buffer or z-buffer uh, if you're Canadian or British. Um, I believe they, they use the term z for z. Uh, it's also probably more correctly called a depth buffer. Uh, and because really it has nothing to do with the z coordinate. Uh, just to give you a little bit of perspective here, right? You know, in our world, we've got stuff that's like, you know, oh, where's this? This is the x-axis, this is the y-axis, this is the z-axis. And it just so happens that we tend to go, okay, when we do our transform uh, into screen space, we tend to decide to align x this way, y this way, and z goes into the screen. I'm sorry, that's not true. It comes out of the screen, depending on whether you're uh, left-handed or right-handed. Um, but we tend to think of things this way, and we tend to think of uh, things this way. So when we're talking about looking at the screen and talking about how far away something is at a particular pixel, it happens to be the z axis that goes into and out of the screen, right? Because this is the y on the screen, this is the x on the screen. And so z is coming in or out directly uh, of the screen. But you know, it's kind of a crude term. What we're really talking about, again, is, is the depth. Right, So it doesn't matter x, y, z. Those are just things we use for nomenclature. It happens to be how we use it. We're just talking about the depth, how deep into the screen something is. Uh, and so these sorts of things, just you could call it a depth buffer more properly, uh, is, is really the, the term that probably should be used. Z buffer is kind of the old, an old way of saying it, especially because uh, there was something called a w buffer as well, which was using a different format that wasn't really the z coordinate and all these other sorts of things. So uh, again, like, you know, these are just kind of shorthand names for this thing that are maybe for historical. We'll talk about them a little bit more later. Uh, but really, the, the real sort of uh, tangible idea that this thing is, is that it is a buffer that restores, that stores the depth of things um, uh, on the screen. And so let's talk about that. All right. Uh, so what we know <clears throat> when we do rendering is that obviously, and we've already done this because we already wrote a renderer that does this, is we have a thing that stores R, G, B, and A at every pixel, right? So typically what we're doing is we're reading from some sprites or whatever we're reading from that's like the source uh, information. And like we do in Handmade Hero, we may have some fairly advanced code that does like bilinear filtering on these things and all sorts of other nonsense to sort of scale and rotate them or do whatever else it's going to do. But eventually, we figure out uh, a single RGBA color that we're going to write to a particular pixel location. And so then on the screen, if here's our screen, right, uh, we typically have some kind of a frame buffer. And we write this RGBA pixel that we figured out what the color should be. We write that into a particular location, right? So our notion of what the screen is is a buffer that holds at every pixel value some R, G, B, and A value, right? Now, the A value is not super useful to us most of the time in Handmade Hero because we don't use, it's, it's called destination alpha. Right, um, and uh, you know we use the RGBA, we use that alpha channel on the input on the source bitmaps, right on the sprites. We use that all the time to determine where they are transparent and where they are solid. So obviously, A is very important in our sprites, but is A important in our frame buffer? Not really. But that's only because we haven't written any algorithms that really use it. Now we could, right? Uh, we could write rendering algorithms that use that alpha value to tell us something about how much coverage there has been of this pixel so far. Um, 
You can use the destination alpha, for example, to do things like when you are compositing, uh, if you want to composite in other orders besides uh, back to front in order to get transparency to work properly and stuff like that. So it's, you know, you can think about this alpha channel that's there in that, you know, this, it's, an, it's a, just an extra 8 bits. You can already think about that alpha channel that we have in addition to our red, green, and blue color as sort of already extending the notion of the frame buffer to include extra data we can use, right? And that's the core concept that we're looking at here with the depth buffer. We don't happen to use it on Handmade Hero, I don't believe, in any real sense. Oh, wait, no, we do. Um, when we make multiple frame buffers, right? Uh, remember we uh, did that, that stuff where we wanted to make it so that there was uh, multiple floors in the game? So there was like a floor, and you could see through the floor to a floor underneath it, through like a hole in the floor, and we implemented that. That's an example of where destination alpha sort of made sense, right? We rendered this the sort of this frame buffer here for the top floor, and it left an alpha hole in it so that when we then blitted it on to the final frame buffer, right, it acted like a sprite again. So we did kind of use destination alpha. We just didn't use it in the final frame buffer, right? Um, which again, there are rendering algorithms that even in the, f the, the frame buffer where you're compositing all the stuff that you're doing for the final composite, even there you might use it. We just didn't have to. But okay, so you did even see, you even saw us use destination alpha. Again, just to emphasize what, why I'm uh, sort of driving that point home. What is that? Well, that is an extension of, <coughs> of the thing that we're targeting for our render, our render target, our frame buffer. That's an extension of the thing we're rendering to. That in addition to just storing the colors we want to store there, it's also storing additional information that we can use with later operations to produce an effect that we need, that we require for our final results. That's what that A is, right? So it's an augmentation, right? All right. So a depth buffer is nothing more than that. A depth buffer is just saying, hey, we've got an R, a G, a B, and an A in here. What if we then just said, let's add more? Let's add more stuff, right? So maybe these are all eight bits, right? So we've got eight, 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 eight. What if we then said, let's add some more stuff in here? What if we added some 24-bit value, right, that was a depth component? Uh, and oftentimes, there's an 8-bit value for something called a stencil. This is a way that this is, this is kind of old school, uh, to be honest. Um, I don't know that this is really how you would necessarily conceptualize it as much today, but I'm sort of going to take you back to the, the Quake days uh, when 3D hardware first came online to start supporting stuff like Quake. It looked like this. Uh, so instead of having this is 32 bits, let's augment it with another 32 bits. So now we've got essentially 64 bits per pixel, let's say, right? Um, <clears throat> so let's talk about that. All right. So let's suppose we augment the 64 bits per pixel, and now whenever we're rendering, what we're going to write to every pixel uh, is yes, the R, the G, the B, and the A, just like we were doing before. We can store all four of those components however we want to, whatever we're doing there for blending or alpha blending, all those sort of things, whatever. That's working the same way as it was. But now, every time we write a pixel, we're also going to write in a depth value and a stencil value. Right? We're just going to write those in there. Uh, and what are those? Uh, well, for now, let's just say they're whatever we want them to be. We don't need to really talk too much about how they're computed, but we're just going to augment it with that piece of information. Uh, so that part, the writing part, will be exactly the same. When we go to actually store a pixel, we are doing nothing more than just writing two 32-bit values, uh, or one 64-bit value if you want to think of this as one big thing. And we're breaking it up into RGBA depth and stencil. Okay. So it's no different. It's just writing 64-bit pixels at a time instead of 32-bit pixels at a time. But there's no other difference. Uh, it's exactly the same. But now we are going to say, let's augment the top part of that right. Now, you remember how we used to do stuff, right? Uh, so I'm going to talk about sort of our old pixel fill first. So our old pixel fill, uh, how did we do that? Well, we sampled textures. Right, uh, and we like bilinear filtered them, right? 
Uh, so we would have something like the hero, and this was in a texture, you know, or a sprite is what we call it in the 2D parlance oftentimes, but you know, it's a texture. Uh, and when we implemented the 3D path for Handmade Hero, right, we allocated a texture on the card for the sprite. Uh, so at the top of our pixel fill loop, right, we would go grab wherever we thought we were in the texture somewhere. Uh, we would grab four pixels, right, you know, A, B, C, D. We would blend those together with a bilinear filter, and we would come up with a source color. Right? That's how we would do that. I guess I should draw it like this. <laughs> we sample the texture, we bilinear filter it, we come up with a source color, right? Uh, we would then look, uh, in fact, I, I should probably draw this even better. Uh, let me, in fact, let me just do this, let me do this really much better. Here we go. Uh, so we would sample from the texture. Right? Um, that would produce for us uh, this, the A, B, C, D. Uh, we would then pass that through the bilinear filter. And the bilinear filter, again, was looking at where inside that four pixel box we were. And it was blending proportional to that. Uh, so it would produce a source color. So now we just have one color value. Uh, we would then sample the destination. Right? Uh, so here's the screen, right? This was the screen, whatever it was. We'd say, where is that going? Uh, and that would produce a desk color. So we had the place on the screen we were drawing to. We had the place of the texture we, was, we were grabbing from. Uh, and we would add, let me call that source. Uh, we would add the source to the destination using a blend. Right? And that blend was proportional to the alpha value, right? uh, specifically the source alpha value. So whatever was in here, right? because this source had an alpha value, whatever was in here would guide us to how we would blend together. If the alpha value was 255, then the source completely replaced the destination. If the alpha value was 0, we did nothing. The source got thrown out. And if it was somewhere in between, we would add the source proportional to that versus the destination proportional 1 minus that. Right? So we'd inversely blend it. Right? Um, and furthermore, in here, these were pre-multiplied. Right? Not that that matters for this discussion. But these are pre-multiplied. Uh, so we had some other things in here like gamma and pre-multiplication, but that was really only to deal with the color and alpha channels. It has nothing to do with the structure of this loop, right? So that's the old way we were doing things. Uh, now the new way of doing things is almost exactly the same. It just has an, uh, an additional step, right? So we have a sample texture. We have a sample texture step. Uh, and it does produce four of these guys, right? <clears throat> uh, and it, does gonna, it is going to do the same stuff. So it is going to do the bilinear, same exact thing, right? But in addition to the sample of the texture that comes in, right, we're also going to get somewhere, and I, and I guess I should say there was an additional step, I think, actually in here uh, that I didn't talk about, right? There was a color interpolation. Right, that came in here. Right? Because if you remember correctly, when we would specify our bitmap, right, we would specify a color for that bitmap. Um, and uh, I don't really know if we actually interpolated it, to be honest. Maybe we didn't interpolate it. Uh, but there was a color that came in here that was, we could set when we were drawing the sprite that would tint it. Right? It would shade the color. So we actually had an input that was constant. It doesn't come from the texture. It came from outside. Right? And anyway, this is the part right here that gets replaced with something more complicated. So now, in here, right when we have our source color, right? so we have our source uh, after our texture sample and our bilinear, uh, we have a new thing that comes in from the side. Yes, we have color. We would still have that <clears throat> coming in here. But we also have uh, Z stencil, or right, let's say depth stencil. OK. <clears throat> 
And what are these two things? Well, the depth value is wherever we drew this sprite. So let's say we were drawing the sprite somewhere in the world. We've got Handmade Hero, and you know, here's the trees or whatever. Uh, and we're drawing the sprite here. Well, when we specified where the sprite was, we specified a Z value. And that Z value might have been different at all of the pixels. So if this thing is standing up straight in the world, it may be higher at its top than its bottom. So maybe the Z value is, you know, is you know, 1.3 here or something. Um, and the Z value here is like 2.6 or something, right? And so as you go up the sprite, depending on which row of the sprite you were on, it might get to be more, right? So the middle of this thing here is going to be higher than 1.3, less than 2.6. The top is going to be 2.6 exactly, and so on, right? So it will interpolate the Z across the surface of this sprite. And that's important to remember. We'll get back to why that's important in a second. OK? And then the stencil value is just going to be a constant thing that we set, right? Uh, so our stencil value is just something that, in addition to setting the Z, we're going to set the stencil. And we're just going to set the stencil once for the entire thing. It's not going to be interpolated. And we'll talk about what it even is in a second, right? <clears throat> OK. So then when these pieces of information come in here, color, depth, and stencil, we are essentially augmenting this bilinear filtered result, so it's S, source color, alpha value. We now have a depth value. I guess that's a bad thing to write it as. I'll write it as Z for now. We now have a depth value, right? Uh, and I'll, I don't know what I'll write stencil as. Let's write it as L, let's say. Right? We now have an augmented pixel that has, in addition to what we sampled from the texture, we have now a z value that was wherever we are on the actual sprite, its actual z value, right? And a stencil value that's something that was input from the exterior routine, right? Uh, and so that's very similar to the color in this sense that we just set it. It's just an arbitrary thing we set. Now, z is an arbitrary thing we set as well, to be clear. But it's got a real, it means something specific. So even though we could set it to something arbitrary, we're not setting it to something arbitrary. We're setting it to something very specific about where it's located in the world. Whereas the stencil and the color value are very arbitrary, and they have to do with what we're trying to do, like how are we trying to color this particular sprite or whatever, right? Uh, and you'll see more about what the stencil value means in a second. All right. So now that we have an augmented pixel, something that's got additional information in it, we now pass it through the real meat of the situation. Uh, and let me just say, like, uh, this, is, this is the addition part here. Uh, I, I'm not going to leave that in there because I want to write in what it actually is. This part uh, then comes uh, exactly the same as well, right? Uh, so at the end, we're going to do exactly the same thing. But uh, th it's this part in here that changes. OK, so once we have this, we are then going to sample the destination just like we did before, right? Uh, and the destination comes in. Now, remember, the destination has the Z buffer, right? It has the depth buffer information and the stencil buffer information because it is 64 bits big, right? Our sprites are not 64 bits big. Our sprites are getting augmented by that input value, the, those additional values that were input when we told it to draw the sprite where we told it to draw the sprite, right? So our, our source textures are still 32 bits big. But our frame buffer, remember, is 64 bits. So when we sample the destination, we get a dest color, right? We get the dest alpha that we don't care about. We're not using it right now. Uh, but now we get a dest z and a dest l, right? So now we have both a source, maybe I should put an s above these. We have a source um, z and a source stencil. And we have a dest z and a dest stencil as well. OK? So here is where the big change happens. Now, before doing this blend operation, what we do is a step, uh, and it's often called kill uh, for some reason, uh, because basically it's saying terminate the pipeline early, I guess is why it's called kill. Uh, but uh, um, it's often called like text kill or stuff like this. Uh, yeah. I, it's, I have no idea why these things are called this. Uh, but uh, the, the more correct term for it, I think, and the one that's used more in the OpenGL spe uh, spec is pass, uh, which sounds a little less threatening as well. Uh, so what we do now is we do comparisons. Okay, We compare the uh, source Z and the dest Z. We compare the source uh, stencil and the dest stencil. 
uh, and we produce an idea about whether this pixel operation that we're about to do passes our criteria for actually occurring, right? So we do a source Z uh, versus dest Z comparison, right? Uh, and we see whether it passes. We do a source, source stencil versus dest stencil comparison, and we see if it passes. Uh, and we can also, even if we would like to, uh, we can do other pass operations when we start getting other things like based on the alpha values of things. There's, there's a lot with sh programmable shaders, there's all sorts of things you can do here. So I'm just kind of talking about the more traditional ones now. But programmable shaders get into la la land really quickly, and you can do all sorts of things with them. So by no means, don't take this as the complete set of things that you can do. I'm more talking about just the basic pipeline, what a basic pipeline does. OK. Um, and what's critical about this is these are actually user settable, right? So we can actually choose to say whatever operator we want in here, like greater than, you know, equal to, not equal to, less than or equal to. Any comparison we want, we can stick in here, OK? So pretty obviously, you can see if you just look at the Z part of this, here is where we can get our per pixel sorting, right? Because if we go back to the example we originally started with, where I had an A and a B, and I want B to be uh, in front of A, right? So in this region, I want B to come first. I want to see B. I don't want to see A, right? Well, the Z value uh, for all of A right, wherever I'm drawing that, you know, maybe that's 1.3 or whatever, right? And let's say Z is 2.6 or whatever, something like this. So in my world, Z comes closest, further towards the screen, let's say. So I want B to be in front. Well, at all of the pixels in here, what's going to happen is A will have been drawn, right? Because I'll come in here and I'll draw A. There's nothing in the Z buffer yet because it's just A. Uh, so whenever we load in whatever we've cleared our z value, you know, maybe our z value when we cleared it was zero. So everything in the frame buffer is zero. We come in to draw a, and we're drawing 1.3 everywhere, right? So we just write 1.3s in because we're constantly comparing 1.3 and zero and saying, oh, you know, and in this world, right? I said z z gets bigger as we come closer to the screen. So what I'd want to do is to say if I want these things to pass. I want the source Z to be bigger than the destination Z, right? So I'd use a greater than here. That's what I'd set that to, right? I want source Z greater than dest Z, let's say. Uh, so it would come in here and say, oh, 1.3 is bigger than 0. Write it, write it, write it, write it, write it, write it, write it. And so our whole frame buffer at that point would have 1.3s all throughout here, zeros everywhere else. Then we come to draw B. And in all these areas, well, it just loads a 0 and says, well, 2.6 is bigger than 0. In this area, right, it loads a 1.3. But 2.6 is still bigger than 1.3, so it will draw B first, right? Now, what's crucial about this is it doesn't matter what order we render these two, right? Because if we were to draw B first, it would write 2.6s all through here. And then when A rendered, it would load the 2.6s out of here and go, is 2.6, is 1.3 greater than 2.6? No. So don't draw the pixel, right? So it's testing every pixel. And now we don't care. This is order independent, right? So we get this really nice solution of just being able to dump everything down to the GPU if we don't care. And it will just do the test per pixel to figure out whether or not something should be in front of something else, and you're done. Now, this provides a lot of additional power. It means that we can not only do we not have to sort, because we can just throw things down order independently, but we can also do stuff like have two things that intersect. So for example, if we were to look at two objects that crossed through each other, like this, right? Well, if we were to look at this from here, right, we would expect to see something like this. If this is A and this is B, right? We would expect to see B all through here and A right in here, 
right? Even though A might have existed back here because it's passing through it, uh, we want to not see it. And that'll work just fine because since the Z values are interpolated, anywhere that A passes in front of B, A will draw first, and everywhere that it passes behind B, it will draw second. It doesn't matter whether they pass directly through each other. So sprites can just intersect and do everything else, and you're still fine, right? So that's pretty nice. Now, I'm going to talk about the stencil value next, but then I'm going to talk about some caveats here because it's not all rosy. There are some issues that you have to be aware of. Um, and so I'll give kind of a little bit of a, of a just a brief explanation of those. Uh, but here is a uh, additional part of the pipe, right? We said there's a stencil value. What does that do? Well, if you think about what happens here, this Z value gives you a nice way of having a, a single um, floating point value that you can use uh, to determine how to sort things. But uh, back when SGI was doing things, because uh, way back in the Silicon Graphics era, I believe that's where the stencil buffer came in. I don't know if they invented it, but they definitely had them on their machines. Uh, this was an additional thing that allowed you to do sort of more, uh, I guess, traditional blocking of things uh, if you wanted to. So what a stencil is, is a stencil is an 8-bit value. Well, I mean, you know, it could be really anything, but traditionally it was an 8-bit value. That's just looked at more as binary, right? Uh, and what you could do with it is you could say, well, OK, uh, maybe I want to set a thing that says, like, if the stencil value is equal to some value that I want it to be equal to, then I'm going to draw, and otherwise I'm not going to draw, right? And so what you could do is you could um, do effectively raster operations um, onto the frame buffer where you could do stuff like say, oh, OK, I'm going to draw you know, uh, into here a primitive that just sets the stencil value to 2 everywhere in there. And then I'm going to uh, do a rather raster operation that sets this value to 1. right? Now when I render, I'm going to do something that, well, that's actually not that useful because those are rectangles, so you'd probably do that with clipping. Let me do that a little bit more uh, crazily. Maybe I set this value to 1 and this value to 2, right? And that's something you can't really do with a straightforward viewport clip, right? You could do it with a clipping plane. Uh, you know what? I'll go even crazier just to make it so unlikely to be able to do it with a clipping plane. You do this. <laughs> it's a circle, an arc. So there's the one. There's the two. So I can't really set up any clipping planes or anything like that to do it. It's an arc. It's, it's harder to do, right? Nowadays, hilariously, in shaders, you could still do that by using screen space evaluation of a circle to figure it out. But don't just forget it. Don't even go there. Let's not go there. Point being, in the primitive days, back in an SGI, you could not have done that. So you know, stencil buffers are less likely to be used these days because there's so many other options. But in those days, uh, I'm just trying to give you the perspective back from when these things first sort of happened. Um, so you could, you could do operations on the stencil buffer to set, uh, on the, the part of the buffer that stores the stencil value, to set things like this. And then you could set up basically binary equivalents. Say, hey, you know what? When I'm drawing here, I only want to draw to places where the stencil value equals 1. And then I'm going to do another pass where I draw to things that are stencil e equals 2 to sort of create blocks of my scene. Right? So I can create like UI places or picture-in-picture -picture sorts of things that can be, have fancy outlines. They don't have to be like rigidly clipped to a rectangle. Right? And so typically, uh, in the old days, this rode on the same 32 bits as the Z buffer. And the hardware to do it was kind of enabled by default if Z buffering was on. So typically, when you talked about a Z buffer pipeline, you typically got stencil sort of for free. And it was just this extra little technique you had that in addition to a Z value, which was this 16, 24-bit value, depending on the case, you maybe also got this 8-bit stencil value to play with as an additional bonus. right? Now, that wasn't always the case. You might have had only a 16-bit Z buffer and no stencil. It depended on, again, the hardware and the situation. But I'm just giving you some perspective there that this was this extra thing. 
right? And you can see why those two went together because they're basically the same sort of thing. They're just this little comparison of the source and the destination that just produces a bit basically that says, do I want to actually draw here or do I want to fail and just stop drawing this pixel altogether, right? And so that's all that was. So that's how a z-buffer pipeline works. And you can see how it gets rid of the whole problem of having to do sorting like we did in the old pipeline, because now the sorting is done per pixel. And so it just works. It's nice. You can shove as many things you want into it, and they'll always get sorted correctly, because every pixel gets sorted on its own. OK. Um, let's talk about the caveat. You know how people say caveat emptor? I don't know what that means. I've never looked it up. I'm going to say like caveat emperor, because that sounds cooler. Like maybe the emperor needs to be aware of this situation, uh, because he wasn't thinking about it. Anyway, uh, so there is one nasty problem that comes along with this. And for a handmade hero, I don't think it'll be that nasty. Uh, because of our situation. But uh, if you are the sort of um, saucy gentleman that, that writes these sort of uh, really advanced 3D pipelines, uh, like you know uh, the Crytek engine, the Doom engine, these sorts of things uh, that are you know, super, super advanced kinds of stuff, uh, you have to care about this sort of thing. And it can uh, be a, a big concern, and you've got your ways that you work around it, right? Um, <clears throat> and so I just want to kind of talk about those a little bit. On Handmade Hero, I think we'll probably have a lot easier time uh, because we don't have the kind of scene complexity that something like Doom has, right? So anyway, uh, there's a problem that happens here. And that problem is with the blending. Uh, and basically, the problem is that blending is not order independent. Okay. Uh, so what I was just saying about the z-buffer, what's really, really nice about the z-buffer is it basically allows your 3D pipeline to not care about sorting. So now you can render your primitives in any order that you want. right? So I can just stack things all over the place, render them in any order. And if I've got things that are looking like this, right? It doesn't matter what order I send these things down. If this is A, you know, B, C, D, or whatever, it doesn't matter if I draw it B, C, D, A, or A, B, C, D, or C, D, A, B, or B, D, C, A. Uh, none of those matter because it will always sort correctly because it's using the actual Z coordinate of the actual thing relative to the camera to figure out how to sort this stuff, right? Uh, and when we get further, I should also just sort of preface this by saying, I'm not talking right now very much about what that z value actually is in this buffer, what that depth value is. It actually is a little more complicated because you can choose what it actually is. There's a lot of different ways you can choose to have it be evaluated. And so we'll get to that more when we get down to the actual nitty gritty. Uh, but just there's some depth value in there that we can count on, and the sorting just works. right? So this allows us to be completely order independent. The problem is that blending, right? That operation we had always been doing, where we did one, um, oh, sorry, where we did source alpha times source plus one minus source alpha times dest, right? You remember this? This is the linear blend. It's the thing that's the backbone of like all game everything, uh, right? Uh, and this is how we were blending our colors into the display, right? Well, what you can see about this is it's not order independent, right? It's talking about these alpha values. This destination is some uh, previous set of lens that have happened. And this SA1 minus SA, right? It's in fact this 1 minus SA right here. The number of times that something gets multiplied by that 1 minus SA changes based on the order, right? So if I do things in one order versus another, uh, I may end up with a very different uh, result than if I do them in, in a 
a different way, right? This gets ex exacerbated once the Z buffer is involved uh, for another reason, which is that values may actually get killed entirely. So let me give you a, just a very simple example of how this becomes a problem. Uh, and you can sort of uh, hopefully see what I mean when I say there's a, there's a, a nasty issue here, right? So let's say I've got something uh, in the world uh, that's supposed to be translucent or transparent, right? Uh, let's say it's a bubble. So here is Handmade Hero, right? Uh, and here is a little bubble that Handmade Hero blew, right? So if he's blowing bubbles, uh, here it is. In our current Handmade Hero, this is really just not a problem. These things will sort, uh, if this is A and this is B, these things will sort so that B gets drawn first and A gets drawn after. That's exactly what we want because the hero is drawn here, right? And then this uh, transparent uh, bubble gets drawn on top. What that means is that all of those values for the hero are already in the frame buffer so that when the bubble is drawn, it can pick them up, blend with them, and write them back so it will nicely shade the hero with the bubble's color, which is exactly what we want. What will happen in a Z buffer situation? Well, first of all, we can no longer just throw everything into the same batch and expect it to work. Why can't we do that? Well, the reason that we can't do that is because this bubble, if it happened to get drawn first, would completely erase the hero. Because when the bubble gets drawn, it will draw into the Z buffer its, uh, its values. And when it draws its, its values into the Z buffer, right? Nothing else will be able to draw there. Now, if the bubble happens to get drawn second, then it's okay. Because when the bubble is getting drawn, it will pick up the Z values of the hero, and that it will say, I'm closer than the hero, and so I, I should draw on top, and then it'll work. But you can see that that order dependence now comes back, right? We had gotten rid of it for opaque things, but now it comes back for transparent things. So the only real solution that we have here uh, in the trivial sense of the word, if all we have is a Z buffer, is we still we get back to sort of coarse sorting, which is that all of our transparent objects have to go into one bin, and all of our non-transparent objects can go into the other bin, and then we draw all the non-transparent objects first, and we draw all the transparent objects second, right? You can see how that would then fix this problem of the bubble erasing the hero entirely, right? <clears throat> but even that isn't a complete solution. What if we have two bubbles that overlap each other? Well, if one bubble is closer than the other bubble, it will produce a different result than if it was further away. Because again, the shading is not order independent. This is not an order independent equation. If I apply this equation, uh, you know, hero bubble one, bubble two, I will get a, you know, a different result than if I do hero bubble two, bubble one. So again, the sorting actually has to occur again if we want order independent uh, transparency to actually work, it has to be sorted, right? And I shouldn't say order dependent. Transparency always is order dependent, so we have to sort it in order to make it work. And this is just a real bummer. Now, there are ways around this that are non-intuitive, uh, and there are also ways around it that are completely psychotic. And you will never believe that they actually work, but there are ways of doing them. Um, so let me talk about those. So one way around this uh, that's kind of counterintuitive is to change this equation to be order independent, right? Uh, and there actually are proposals for doing this, and you can look and see there are papers that talk about, hey, this is an equation that depends on the order that I apply it. What if I picked an equation that didn't depend on the order in which I apply it? Uh, could I then um, have this work? And one way that you can, you can imagine doing that that is not nuts uh, is to just talk about additive blending, right? One way to do this is get rid of this term. If I just do SASC, oops, if that's all I do, uh, then I have no problem. 
that's just those are just things that make the screen brighter uh, when I operate on it, right? And so one of the things that used to be very common is particles that always made things brighter, like brightening particles, right? And you know these kind of blobby, explosion-y sorts of particles that just make things brighter. Um, that just works. Because then it doesn't matter what order you do this. If you think about what happens here, it just becomes a big, long sum of these values, right? It just You just keep summing them up, and it doesn't matter. So your, your result for a pixel is just SASC plus SASC plus SASC from, from different sprites, right? So it's just that, that darkening, that dimming, of, or, or that lessening of the contribution of the underneath color is the only thing that makes it order uh, dependent in the first place. So you can choose to use some kind of equation that doesn't have that property. But the problem is that limits the kind of composition you can do because you no longer have the option of doing something like that. Now, that is not the only one. There was another one. I remember there was a paper that proposed ways of doing transparency that doesn't have the brightening effect all the time that is also order independent. I don't remember what it was, though. Uh, but there was a paper that talked about that. So there, again, there are options there of saying, well, OK, if we want to go back to just doing the transparent versus non-transparent objects, all we do is sort those, and then we run it, and we let them do their thing, uh, we could pick a, a, a different way of, of retiring that equation, right? But uh, there is another option. And this is the pure lunacy option. Uh, and oddly enough, you can actually do this on GPUs. That's how far GPUs have gotten. It's kind of crazy when you think about it. All right. Uh, so what GPUs have introduced, uh, believe it or not, is atomics. So, <clears throat> and maybe I'll call this, uh, you know, frame buffer atomics. Uh, and I'll try to give you some perspective on what these are. It's completely nuts that you can do this, but it's one of those things where it's like GPUs have gotten so powerful at this point, they're just adding really all kinds of things that, that you wouldn't expect, you know, someone in my position who, you know, saw the first 3D effects card and was like, wow, that's really amazing. To think about the fact that these have atomic frame buffer operations is, is completely nuts, but it's awesome. Uh, and so here's where we go down the rabbit hole of like the kinds of crazy stuff you can do on GPUs nowadays. Um, so if you imagine what happens, what I was talking about there, well, really the reason that we have that problem again is because we're not sorting, right? I mean, the problem is that we're not sorting anymore. Why didn't we want to sort? Well, there was a lot of overhead to sorting. And also, we kind of need to sort things based on the pixel value. Because you know, if we want, again, that case to work where two things intersect, right? Uh, or we have those kind of nasty problems like the painter's algorithm, uh, nightmare problem where you've got uh, you know, triangles that, that do this sort of thing. I'm not going to draw this right, am I? Uh, that's, that's a terrible drawing. I don't know if I can. How do I do eraser? E. There we go. I did it. <clears throat> All right. Uh, so if you have one of these situations where you've got three triangles that actually aren't intersecting, but they all overlap each other, you end up with a cycle that can only be broken by actually splitting the triangles, right? Uh, and again, a Z buffer totally solves this problem because since it operates per pixel, it, has, it doesn't even care. It just, it just works, right? You'll get exactly the right result. Uh, so we want all of these things, but now we want the ability also for all of our transparent stuff to work, right? Um, and it's just like, how are we going to do that? Well, what they end up doing is they do per pixel sorting. And I'm not even making this up. This is actually a real thing. <clears throat> so what they will do is they'll say, all right, what do we need to do to do per pixel sorting? Well, what if I was just to record a fragment color uh, or a pixel color? I won't use the word fragment yet. We'll talk a little bit more about what fragments are later. <clears throat> uh, but what if I was at each pixel location, right? Here's a pixel location. Instead of, you know, right now I'm doing RGBA, Z, and maybe stencil or something, right? 
What if I said, nah, forget that. Instead of just storing one of those per pixel, I'm actually going to store a linked list. So in this pixel, I'm going to store a pointer to one of these RGBAZs, and then a pointer to the next one. And I'm not even making this up. It's a linked list of this stuff where every time I write to the pixel, I add a new link to the chain, right? So if I overdraw this thing eight times, if there's eight things overlapping this pixel, I'll actually have eight links in the chain. Right? Then I write a, a shader that does a resolution of that buffer, right? that resolves that buffer, that all it does is after all the rendering is done and every pixel is a linked list of values, it then goes through and sorts the linked list at every pixel, and then retires the fragments, those uh, pixel values, in order. So that you still get correct order-dependent blending, even though you rendered things potentially completely out of order. <clears throat> I'm not kidding. This actually works. You can actually do it. Now, obviously, there's a huge cost to it, because uh, you, you're taking up a lot more memory. <laughs> Uh, because you have to store, you know, however your much overdraw you have on average, you have to store that much more uh, data in there, right? <clears throat> that's very expensive. So it's, it's by no means some kind of panacea that's just free to do. It's still very expensive, but you can do it. So if you actually want that, you can get it. Uh, and obviously there's optimizations around this one thing that, that you'll often... Uh, see if you were going to approach scheme like this is well you really only need the linked list for the for transparent things the opaque things can all you can still do that bifurcation where you draw like all the opaque things first so that you just have one value in a buffer that's like here's my screen if there were no transparent objects then you just draw the transparent objects into one of these things with a linked list then you can just at the end know that you never uh, you never created extra links for opaque things because you never need to know opaque things um, past a certain point, right? Uh, because you only, uh, I guess I'm not explaining this very well. If I have some stack of stuff, uh, let's, let's look at this uh, uh, as a single pixel. Let's stack it up like it was, um, like we were looking at it from you know, this direction, right? Uh, and there's just a fantastic amount of things stacked on this pixel, right? Uh, so this is just one pixel we're looking at, and we're looking at it this way. So these are all stacked on top of each other, right? A, B, C, D, E, F, G, all stacked on top of each other, right? Uh, well, if you imagine, let's say that A and B are transparent, right? Uh, let's say that C and E are opaque. In fact, let me, let me figure out a better way to label these. Uh, so let's say it's uh, transparent, transparent, opaque, transparent, opaque, opaque, transparent. Right? If I just did the naive thing, I would end up with a linked list that was 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, wait, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. I would have seven links in my linked list, right? And that's a huge, you know, I have to do all that updating and all that work, right? But if I were to instead do something a little bit more clever and say, let's draw all the opaque stuff first, right? So that means I draw C, uh, E, and F. I draw them first. So what I would end up with in that buffer is just F. That's all I would have, right? Then I go to draw my transparent objects. I can use the Z buffer and say, only add to the linked list if my Z buffer passes. That means only the stuff in front of F will pass, which is only one thing. It's just G. It's just this one thing. So I end up with only a linked list of F and G that has to be sorted. And furthermore, like I was saying, I really don't have to sort this part. So really, I can just have a buffer of things that are the opaque backdrop of the scene. That's everything up to the point where the opaque objects stopped and then linked lists of transparent things in front of them. And again, that's free for me to produce beyond just one level of partitioning. It's not even really sorting. It's just a partition of transparent objects and 
opaque objects. And the opaque objects versus transparent objects is just a property of their material. So I don't even really have to look at anything. They don't have to form graphs or anything. I can just purely partition it every time I go to render an object. Is this an object that has transparency or not based on its material uh, settings or whatever? And it just goes into one buffer or the other, right? So you can see how this could be made fairly efficient as long as you, know, you don't have too many transparent things in the scene. Now again, particles make this harder because particles are oftentimes want to be transparent and there's lots of them. So you typically have to think uh, harder about how you're doing stuff like that. And there's lots of ways you can work with these things. When you go down the rabbit hole of modern 3D rendering, it's like all these crazy hacks and ways of doing stuff to get what you want to have happen. Um, <clears throat> It's not clean like ray tracing where the rendering is very straightforward, but the, the spatial partitioning is where the hacking comes in uh, and the sampling and all that stuff, right? So you, you, you know, you, it's, it's different. Rasterization has a different set of hacks, right? Uh, so anyway, so that's how that works. Uh, we're almost out of time, but I think I've covered almost everything. The only thing I wanted to mention is that overdraw still matters. And so this is the one other caveat, uh, which is that just because you have a Z buffer, it's like, yes, the Z buffer does solve your sorting problems for you in a lot of ways. Now, transparency and translucency, it does not. So you still have to come up with other solutions to fix that. You're not out of the sorting woods. Yet, when you have a lot, when you have to, uh, a lot of that in, in, in the game, however you're dealing with it, right? So that still matters. And it's important to understand. But, uh, it does solve all the other sorting problems for you and it allows things to nest in 3D really cleanly because since it's interpolated per pixel, uh, not per object, it ends up with a lot of sorting things that uh, would have caused problems uh, when you had to do them logistically by bounding boxes are no longer problems because now instead of per primitive, it's per pixel and it can resolve things very cleanly like those painter algorithm cycles are not a problem anymore. Even intersection, not a problem anymore. It can still handle that cleanly per pixel, right? But uh, overdraw still does matter. Uh, and let's just say what that actually means. So what overdraw means is obviously like GPUs uh, are fast, but not, you know, infinitely fast. And so, yes, a GPU does allow you to overdraw the screen many times uh, and, and certainly much more powerful than a CPU in terms of filling pixels because that's all a GPU is designed to do. It's just a giant pixel filling machine. So obviously, it's really good at that. And you can take advantage of that and be a bit sloppy in order to get better rendering stuff out of it so that you don't have to think about all the sorting and that sort of thing. And sloppy is the wrong term because you're still you're going towards the strength of what you have, which is not really sloppy. But I just mean you be more loose. You don't have to do all the sorting and stuff like that. But it still matters how much you overdraw because a GPU can't overdraw the screen an infinite number of times. So the speed with which you can draw to the screen is still important. And one of the things that really affects this is not just how many times a pixel is filled, but it's how much work you have to do every time that you fill one. And what that means is, let's say, and this is very important, when you get into shaders. Now, a shader, as you probably know, is basically a piece of code that can be executed on the GPU, uh, for example, per pixel. So on every pixel, you could execute this shader. Uh, that can be a relatively expensive, complicated set of mathematical operations that can do calculations for what that pixel should look like. And these can encompass a lot of very complicated things. Uh, this can encompass things uh, such as like complicated lighting equations that sample multiple light sources, that use shadowing information, uh, that do transforms to figure out what kind of reflectance is happening at this pixel. There's lots and lots of things that can happen. And you can end up with shaders that could be very expensive. They're doing lots of operations operational GPU using lots of floating point computations that can be very, very slow. What that means is the more complicated you make these shaders, the more expensive it can be to overdraw the screen. Because, you know, yes, if all you're doing is taking a constant RGBA value from a texture, like all you're sampling one texture, right, and drawing it to the screen, you may be able to overdraw the screen, just put splat sprites on type of sprites on type of sprites, sprites ad infinitum, and maybe it is basically infinitely fast because, oh my god, GPUs are so powerful per pixel. It doesn't matter. You're fine, right? 
But if all of a sudden, instead of sampling from one texture, you're sampling from 16 textures at a time, you're doing like, you know, thousands of math ops or something to compute all kinds of complicated shading and combining the results from all these textures and surface lighting and tons of shadow maps from tons of lights and all this sort of thing, right? Now this shader is very expensive. And if you're trying to overdraw a pixel with that kind of expensive shader 20, 30, 50, 100 times, all of a sudden your game's performance can slow to a crawl. Because even though the GPU has tons of flops at its disposal, it's not infinite. It can't just do an infinite number of math operations. So even though you have a Z buffer, an overdraw as a graphical artifact is no longer a problem and the sorting doesn't matter. You can just draw as many things as you want and they will sort properly. You still have to understand that filling an actual pixel is costly. What that means is that there are still ways in which you must structure your pipeline if you are going for high performance complicated shaders and stuff like that. You may have to make uh, certain concessions in your pipeline designed to mitigate this problem. And so one example of a way that this often works is what's called a Z prepass. Uh, and what this is, is, hey, I know that I'm going to be using some really complicated shaders that are very expensive. So I really don't want to worry about that situation that I just described where I've got like all these things stacked up. Like here's all these pixels stacked up on top of each other. There's six pixels uh, worth of overdraw there, right? Six over, uh, I shouldn't say six pixels. Let's just say six X overdraw. I'm going to overdraw this pixel six times, but I've only got enough GPU horsepower to execute my shader like two times, right? It's like, so what am I going to do? Uh, you know, do I start to try and cull my scene more aggressively? You know, what do I do? Uh, and the answer is, well, for opaque stuff, actually you have another option at your disposal. What you can do is draw the scene at 6x overdraw, just like you were doing, but with no shader, basically, right? Get rid of the shader, turn it off. Instead of filling the color values of the buffer at all, just write to the Z buffer, right? And this is called a Z prepass. So what it does is it fills this, that Z val buffer with whatever the latest buffer value actually was, right? So even though there are six different things that all overlapped this pixel, I only end up with the Z value of the final one. And it was pretty cheap for me to do because no complicated shader was getting run. There were, you know, 10 math ops in my simple Z pass shader, not a thousand math ops in my super complicated mega lighting ridiculousness shader, right? Now, once I have done my Z prepass and I have that final Z value, I do the actual color pass, right? Where I do execute the thousand math ops shader, but what I do is I predicate that on Z uh, of uh, being equal to Z, right? On my source Z being equal to my dest Z. So I say, remember back here at our, um, <clears throat> where are we gonna get the come? Where are we? Where I drew it up here somewhere? Okay, here it is, right? Remember, because we've got this, uh, this sort of theoretical pipeline happening, I've got these pass comparisons, and I'm going to say the source Z has to be equal to the destination Z of this buffer in order for this pixel to pass, right? What that means is I will never draw a pixel if it's not the final one that we would have seen. So all those other pixels don't have to be drawn. And what's really great about modern GPUs is they're smart enough to early out. So even though this comparison conceptually happens at the end of the pipeline, right, in some sense, they actually do it up here. So what they will do is at the earliest possible time, and of course, depending on how you write your shader, shaders can modify the Z value and stuff like this, so the earliest possible time may not be right at the beginning, but either way. At the earliest possible time they can, they will determine whether or not this pixel will be drawn. And if it cannot be drawn, they will not bother doing all of these operations, right? So that's really, really cool because it means that you can save a lot of computation. 
Now, it's not quite as rosy as I make it sound. And the reason for that is because these things are wide. As we've talked about before, GPUs uh, work the same way as our CPU renderer worked. And if you remember, we fill multiple pixels at a time. We filled, I think, four pixels across at a time. We filled this at a time. GPUs typically will do more like, you know, this at a time. Right? Uh, so GPUs will kind of fill more like a 4x4 four four block or something like that at a time. Um, depending on the architecture, I don't keep up with this sort of thing. So I don't really know how many pixels they fill at a time at the moment. Uh, but they fill a bigger swath of pixels at a time than a CPU. But basically, it's the same thing. And if you remember how that works is what happens is the entire pipeline gets run uh, for all 16 pixels at a time. And you can only early out if all 16 pixels are not going to pass that Z. So what that means is you do end up with some wastage there. Because if you did have some of these pixels pass, you're going to, but a bunch of them wouldn't have, you're still going to blow all of those 1,000 math ops computing the entire 4x4, even though you only needed a little bit of it. So to a certain extent, it's not as perfect as it would be if every pixel only ran uh, in terms of flops. You're actually talking about it on a slightly coarser level, but hopefully things are not going in and out quite so closely per pixel anyway. Like presumably your triangles are at least as big as a few of these. So you know, typically a triangle is going to at least take up some of that space, let's say, especially when you start getting to higher resolutions. So you know, a Z prepass is definitely really great. Uh, and it can eliminate certainly all of this crazy far back stuff. Uh, but when you start to get to the edges of things, it's not quite as, uh, uh, you know, as perfect as you would expect if you were thinking of it as a per pixel basis. So overdraw still matters. And when you're looking at higher end graphics performance, you need to think about it and have a pipeline that acknowledges the fact that it is not free to compute pixels. Uh, so if the pixel uh, color values you're computing are never shown on the screen, you want to take um, steps to mitigate that. Even if you are still requiring the Z buffer to do most of that culling for you, you still, um, sort of need to uh, be aware of that. So uh, I'll go ahead and take questions. We'll probably, uh, obviously, we don't have any time um, for uh, um, to do any code today, because we had just a lot of stuff to cover there. Uh, didn't know how long I would take to explain all that, but there's a lot of stuff in there. Uh, so we'll take a look at actually doing some coding tomorrow. Uh, if, if anyone has any questions, um, let, me, uh, let me just go ahead and, and uh, Take a look. Uh, Disused asks, is it possible to use dithering and possibly post-processing and super resolution for order independent transparency? Uh, yes, uh, it is. One, you know, it, one way that you uh, used to do transparency in the old days, uh, order independent transparency to a certain extent, uh, was to do screen door, what's called the screen door effect. Uh, and what that is is, again, you just um, you basically say, well, OK, you know, one way to do it is to think of a pixel as a particular color value. And I'm just going to try to write to the pixel and do the alpha blending per pixel. Another way to look at it is let's look at more than one pixel at a time. So maybe I'm looking at more of a grid of pixels. And what I'll do is if a thing is transparent, I'll fill in just maybe like every other pixel or something like this, you know? Uh, in some kind of pattern. And then I'll hope that when I have other transparent things, they don't quite line up exactly. And so I'll fill them in a different order. And then those things, if I downsampled that buffer, would blend together and produce sort of a transparent effect. right? Uh, and that is certainly one way of trying to approach it. And that actually becomes also, again, more feasible because uh, modern GPUs have something called multi-sample buffers, uh, which are buffers that have per pixel more than one sample. And they're jittered. And you can do some things with that if you want to try to. I don't know that high-end people do that. I think they try to do more of the linked list and chunked rendering sorts of approaches. But that's not really my area of expertise. So I don't feel comfortable saying one way or the other whether that's a technique that people use nowadays in actual high-end work or not. Um, you would have to ask a more dedicated rendering uh, sort of person 
how prevalent a technique like that tends to be these days. But it's definitely, it's definitely, I guess all I'm trying to say is it's definitely plausible. It was used in the past. I just don't know if it's really relevant today. That's, that's all I'm trying to say. Was enabled per pixel sorting on the graphics card. What, if any, software control is available via shaders, or is this just a hardware optimization that some graphics cards do behind the scenes to handle the opacity issue without pre-filtered Z-buffer? Um, actually, it's entirely in shaders. Uh, so it's entirely up to you. That implementation of the linked list thing is actually entirely up to you. The, um, I, I guess I, I was kind of going kind of fast, and I sort of skipped this part. I didn't say why this was important. I just said that it was there. Uh, the point of the atomics, now you know what atomics are if you've been watching Handmade Hero. Atomics are a way of multiple CPU cores um, or multiple CPUs uh, to synchronize their access to memory in a way that they don't accidentally overwrite each other. And this is very important for multi-threaded programming because at the place where those uh, threads have to communicate, you need a way of synchronizing them, and atomics are the only way to do that because otherwise the two cores would just write on each other's memory and have no idea. They would not be able to sync up in any real way. So you need some way, at least one way, of being able to cleanly signal uh, a write to a memory that you know will not get overwritten by somebody else uh, sort of in flight, right? Uh, and so for a long time, GPUs never had anything like that that was accessible to you. It, 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 they obviously had to deal with this internal to themselves because they are heavily multi-threaded internally. Uh, but then they started exposing these to the shaders. I believe AMD is the people who first introduced it several years ago, Atomic Writes to the Frame Buffer. Uh, and what these are is they're just like the things you can do on the CPU, like Atomic Increment or something like this, or Atomic Swap. Um, and what they allow you to do, uh, sorry, atomic exchange, I should say. And what they allow you to do is when you are doing a write to a frame buffer, you can actually do that write atomically. So you can have two people looking at the frame buffer going, I want to put uh, a, uh, I shouldn't say frame buffer either, just the destination, whatever the thing is that you're writing to. Um, I want two people to be able to act at the same time. I want them to be able to atomically swap a linked list value in and know that nobody else did that same swap at the same time. Right, uh, And so that allows you to, in the shader, build the linked list. And then later, you can write a shader that's synchronous, so it's not multi-threaded. Because, hey, it's doing it for every pixel. So, I mean, it is multi-threaded in the sense that every thread can be operating in different pixels. But there aren't multiple threads trying to talk, to the same, talk about the same pixel. That one can just be a shader that literally walks the linked list. And these are you write these in shaders. That's how advanced shaders are these days. Shaders are incredibly, incredibly um, uh, complicated and powerful. They can do almost uh, everything uh, that you can do in regular C code, really. Uh, you can do that in the shader. They're very general purpose. Um, they have different performance characteristics, but they're very general purpose. That's why you have, um, I mean, you know, uh, there's stuff that will compile C code to run in, in shaders, right? Uh, compute shaders. And uh, so if you're, if you're talking about not shaders that are in the actual graphics pipeline, you literally can write just C code and have it work. That's what these um, OpenCL and uh, CUDA and stuff basically are, is there ways of writing just general purpose code uh, with atomics and everything that just run on the GPU. So they're very, very flexible nowadays. Uh, it's just the like, um, it's just, the difference there is just that the uh, uh, the performance characteristics are different between the two, so you have to be aware of that when you're writing the code. Anonymous five nineteen. What do you think of frame buffering, like Vulkan's mailbox present mode, to decouple the game update rate? From the display device's refresh rate, you can render as many frames as you want, but only the most recently rendered frame is swapped in on vertical retrace. Um, I mean, I guess what I would say about that is I mean, first of all, I would say my opinion is is skewed on something like that. And 
I, I think it's because I have very specific uh, priorities for how I, what I feel like is important um, <clears throat> that do not necessarily align with high-end rendering uh, people's priorities or gamers' priorities necessarily, right? Uh, for, and, and how I would describe my outlook is I think fixed frame rate is critical. I think it drastically affects the uh, way a game feels and I do not find variable frame rate as an acceptable way of displaying graphics. That is my opinion, and it is not necessarily relevant to a certain segment of the gaming population or the developer population, perhaps not even the majority of it, right? They may m much prefer variable frame rates. So in my mind, I would much rather that a game ran at a fixed frame rate, whatever the appropriate fixed frame rate was, with less graphical quality than one that pushed the graphical quality limit right to the edge and didn't quite always make 30 frames a second. So it swapped at like, you know, sometimes 40 frames per second, sometimes 27 frames a second, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, so I feel like a 100% consistent frame rate is absolutely critical and the most important thing uh, that you can do. And so I don't care about things like mailbox mode because that is totally not, if you're, or if you're in a situation where you can't be synced to the refresh rate so that you always have a frame ready when, when the next uh, predicted frame refresh happens, you have already lost the battle, and uh, I, I uh, consider it a failure, right? So because of that, that's not a kind of mode that I'm interested in. But you can understand why that mode might be very important to some people who have different priorities. If your priority is very high graphics quality, and you don't want to make concessions uh, to maintain a fixed frame rate, right, uh, then you can understand why something like mailbox mode would be very important, right? Uh, because it allows you to get that trade-off much more narrowly, right? It allows you to really target 100% of the GPU power every frame. You don't have to leave any slop there, because if you're a little bit over or a little bit under any time, it doesn't matter, because the frame rate swapping will be much closer to accurate. So you can understand the value of something like that. It's just not a value I want. And, uh, and so, yeah, and so I, it's up to every developer to have their own opinion about that. And for devs that are about that maximization, those are the kinds of modes that, that really make a lot of sense, right? And by the way, I should add that that attitude that I'm talking about, that's my preference, pervades like everything in the pipeline. So that means like, for example, I would never make a pipeline that was designed to accelerate something like, oh, I'm inside a room, so I'm gonna cull the stuff on the other side of this wall because I know that I can't see through it. Because I know that as soon as I step away and look at a, mirror, at a, a window where I can see outside, that my frame rate would just tank if I was relying on that culling to eliminate the stuff on the other side, right? So I always tend to, to think about pipelines as I want them to always do an exactly predictable amount of work all the time, which is a very different way of looking at a pipeline than uh, I want to maximize the graphical quality of any given scene that I'm in. Um, those are really different attitudes, and they, per they, they pervade everything that you do. And uh, I don't think that either one is right or wrong. You know, uh, It's just about what you value. And I really value that consistency. Like, I want to work towards the most consistent um, graphical presentation that I can get, but that is not going to be the right decision for everyone. And so other people will want to push the most amount of GPU power every frame, 
and we'll make different trade-offs potentially. Is it valid to render to sub buffers and then render those sub buffers to the back buffer so as to be able to render more than one sub buffer at a time? Uh, I don't necessarily know what you mean by the question, but I guess I would just say if I understand it correctly, then not only is the answer yes, but that is exactly what we're doing in Handmade Hero right now, and so and in the 3D path as well. So obviously there's no reason that you can't also do that in 3D if you wanted to, if you need multiple passes which a lot of times you might want to do for a number of reasons. Um, it's an eminently valid technique. And uh, I guess I, I uh, yeah, I would just say definitely yes. Um, but, but we're already doing that in Handmade Hero, even in the 2D path. That's how we do the floor. The alpha fade of the, of the top level floor is done in that um, exact fashion. Uh, and so if you, if you go look at how that's working, that would work exactly the same if, if everything was rendered 3D Z buffery. You just have two Z, you, in addition to two color buffers, you would have two Z buffers as well. And that's, uh, yeah. Uh, so yes. <laughs> and Zilloresco, do not be afraid to ask questions. Uh, Handmade Hero is a complex project at this point, and so it's easy to not really know what's happening in some parts of it. But yes, if again, if that was the question, just wanted to make sure, uh, then yes, we're, we're already doing that. Uh, and moving to 3D does not change that calculus at all. Uh, it's just that we may not have we may not have to do as much of that. Uh, right now, I think we render every floor potentially into a different buffer. I can't remember uh, whether we bother doing that or not. Uh, we might not. In fact, yeah, we probably don't because the only thing we really need is one extra buffer for the alpha faded floor on top. So we, we probably don't really make much use of it. Um, now that I think about it, so probably, yeah, we would probably have a similar situation in 3D where we might have two different buffers uh, and one of the buffers is is for exactly that purpose, right? It's still exactly the same uh, purpose, uh, but we might not have to do it because we could use a Z buffer for this in the future, potentially uh, in a two pass scenario and other sorts of things. So it may be possible uh, for us to do it without a sub buffer now that we've got a Z buffer, but we may still want to do it to, uh, to a sub buffer for other reasons um, that we don't know yet. So I would expect uh, that we would, um, you know, uh, I, I would expect to, to have, um, to, to have at least one extra buffer in the 3D pass as well for, even if it's just for like lighting or who knows what, it may not be for the alpha, but, but we'll, we'll probably have still, we will still use the multiple, uh, render target, uh, stuff, if that makes sense. All right, I'm going to wrap up here. Um, let me see here. There we go. Uh, let me quick double check. Uh, let's see. Do you feel you're still on the path to finishing the game in 600-ish episodes? Uh, I have no idea. Uh, but again, 600 episodes is just a purely arbitrary ballpark. Um, to state the obvious, I, I, this is the first time I've ever done a programming where I've tried to do the teaching at the same time on the stream as the programming. Um, so I, uh, I have absolutely no idea, even when I started, how long it would take because you know a lot of what we do, like today's episode, there's no coding. It was just me explaining stuff so that people would understand what we're going to do. Uh, and so I have no idea how to gauge that sort of thing. So 600 was just a complete ballpark of like, hey, this is how long it maybe would take. 
Uh, I would say it hasn't actually been uh, that unlikely. Like, it looks like that may be roughly true. Um, it's really hard to say. It's a little different now because we just recently switched to two-hour streams on the weekends, twice a weekend. Uh, and so previously, 350 of those were an hour apiece. And now the next 250 up to 600 will be two hours apiece. That's more time, too, right? Um, so I don't know. Uh, we've done most of the engine work. Uh, we're still refining some things. We want to do a little bit of 3D work here before we move forward. Uh, but we're still going to have about 400 hours of gameplay programming we can do. And that's a lot. Um, I'm not a game designer, so you know the amount of gameplay program we're going to do. I don't know how much we really need to do. Um, I don't have that much to say there. I'm just going to show how to do like architectural stuff and how to program game code cleanly and you know try to get that points those points across. But I'm not a game designer, so I don't have a, I don't have to spend a lot of time explaining game design because I don't know it. I'm not gonna I I don't have anything to say about game design. If if you want to learn game design, you're gonna have to go talk to somebody else, right? I'm just talking about how to program the game, assuming that you have a design that you know. Uh, that you like and that you think you can design a game competently. And, you know, so you got to go listen to John Blow or somebody who knows how to design a game you know, if you want to know how to design a game. Uh, and so I think that's uh, the important part to say there. And so, uh, yeah, 600 episodes may be about right. Uh, it's only time will tell. You know, like I said, I have no way of predicting it at all because it's a totally new experience for me. Um, it's not how I normally program. I'm not usually talking the whole time, honestly, so I have nothing to go by. Um, so, yeah. Do you find the weekends go by faster with streaming on them? And you have, you ha do you have more time for 935? Uh, yes, uh, I find that it was very good to move them to the weekends. It's better uh, for work on 935 for sure, and it keeps my schedule a little cleaner, so it's been a, it's been a big plus. Uh, Let's see. And I was, what if I want my game to be deterministic, or what if my game does physics calculations? I need to update at a fixed rate for stability. Uh, different people have different monitors at different refresh rates. Most people seem to, the, uh, to then interpolate, uh, but this adds latency. Isn't mailboxing the better approach uh, in this situation? Uh, well, again, like I was trying to say before, um, I believe that I, I always make concessions uh, for fixed frame rate because I feel like it's very important. Like I was saying, everyone makes their own concessions. So if for what you want is determinism, which I never care at all about at all, right? Uh, I've never cared about determinism. Um, then uh, if what you want is determinism, then you have to make other concessions, right? And you've got a whole bunch of work to do that you might have to, to make there. Uh, what the best approach is for determinism, I don't know that mailbox is necessarily the right approach because for determinism, mailboxing is doesn't really give you anything on fixed frame rate displays very much, right? It's pretty hard to, you're not really getting very much out of it. Um, all it's doing for you is, is kind of helping a little bit once in a while, right? Uh, it's more useful on, on displays with, with variable sync, uh, and, and it, uh, variable sync uh, is not available in, on most gamers' machines. Uh, so, so I don't really know. But uh, all I can say about that is, as a developer who determinism is not a primary goal for me at all, um, I don't tend to think about things that way. Uh, I always just say fixed frame rate is, is the, the big thing. So let's uh, skip this if you'd like. Explained it already. Could you explain Z fighting and solving it as a problem? Uh, not yet. Um, I, uh, I, that's a very good question. And uh, it is something that we're going to talk about. But because I haven't gotten to the point where we're actually talking about what's stored in the Z buffer, it's a little premature because uh, we need to talk about what's in the Z buffer before we can talk about why Z fighting even exists. Uh, but we will get there, and it is important. I don't know that we'll have too much problem with it on Handmade Hero specifically, because I don't know if we'll run into situations where it matters, uh, but we, uh, we might. And uh, depending on how we're doing like certain layering sorts of stuff, uh, and so we will definitely address that. All right, I'm going to wrap it up now. We're over time. Thank you, everyone, for joining me for another episode of Handmade Hero. It's been a pleasure coding with you, as always. Uh, if you would like to follow along at home, you can always pre-order the game on handmadehero.org. It comes with a source code, so you can play around with the same sort of stuff that we're playing around with uh, on stream. 
uh, and learn from the series. We also have a forum site you can go to if you want to ask questions, a Patreon page if you want to support the video series, uh, a schedule bot you can use to figure out when we're going to be live. Uh, generally, we're on weekends at 11 or 10, uh, depending on the, the, the time. Uh, and we also have an episode uh, guide that you can use to catch up on old episodes if you want to see uh, how we've built all the stuff that already exists in the series and are just coming to it now. Uh, that's it for today. I'll be back here tomorrow to talk a little bit more about Z, and we might uh, 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 start programming the depth, uh, depth buffer version uh, of the game tomorrow. Since I think we've covered most of the stuff we need to cover, I'll just have to talk a little bit about how we're going to do 3D transforms and stuff like that. So that may take a little time as well. Depends on uh, uh, where we're at. We may go a different route and turn the Z buffer on first and then go to the 3D transform part of it. Uh, so it depends on how I want to approach that. I can't tell you exactly. We'll find out tomorrow when we start to take a look at what's the most sensible way to approach it. Uh, so I hope to see everyone back here tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow will be 10 a.m. again, uh, so same time, same place. Uh, until then, have fun programming this weekend, and I will see you all on the internet. Take it easy, everybody. <laughs>